did. But when the same thing happened the following night, a few of the men put their heads together and one of them was going to the presbytery with the first like, oh, the wrong, that, the wrong move, says another man, or you won't be believed. And you know the only thing that will come out of that is another sermon about drink and wakes. What do we do? So, says they, here we have a riddle that we can't unravel. Well, says Dorteen, the young curate is known to every one of us. He's not a man with his head in the clouds. When he knows that all the wonders of the world are not in Savannah from the head, he should come here. Come, that man is talking to the old people. He can't put an inkling in the things. It was agreed. They saw the curate in the morning, and unusual as it was, he agreed to be seen in the dead house that night. There he was, sitting above, above on the men's side, dead in the kitchen, when at midnight the saddle horse had asked him to the yard. The door burst open and in came the same man as the two nights before. Walked up, stood over the cops and said, Who is John Bordeaux? A mother good? Did you get that thing you were searching for? The dead girl sat straight up, bolt upright and said, I did not, not a sign of it. The strangers moved to go, but like like the curate was between him and the door, and holding up his hand, he said, I command you to give an account of the commotion that you caused in this house for three nights running. The stranger looked at him, he says, well, I was waiting for someone to ask me that. And looking round the kitchen, he looked at every face and he said, I'm not one of you. I'm from the other world. And our game there at night in the other world was hurling. And we played it every night below in that field. But we have no game now, and all because of that girl lying there. Her job was to stand on the sideline and watch the ball going wide. But she neglected her duty and lost the golden ball. Let me tell you, there will be no peace, no peace in this house until we get it. Where's the hammer, says Gottine, racing around, he found it and smashing in the mouth of the cubby hole, he put out the number marker and threw it to the stranger who wiped it off the sleeve of his coat into the grave. Ah, says he, this is it. Our hurling ball, motioning to the cops, he says, come on, we'll be going now. Oh. The cure is again. You're going, but she's not. Or do you mean to stand there and tell every person in this house that any girl that was so long for every day in front of the fire is going to be, isn't she a changeling? She is, of course, she's a changeling, says the stranger. We have to have a go-between. Well, says the curate, I command you to clear the clouds from her mind and clear her ear. Well, the jolly man's face blackened with the teeth of that stuff and muttering some words. He filled the kitchen with a whirling noise. And like that, the dead girl sat straight up on the tail, hopped off, and stood there, every bit as beautiful as she had in the hydro the two before. The stranger was gone for the dead of the hospital in the yard, and Gautine was the first to over to the girl's side, and taking her by the two hands, he says, Well, no, Mary, you're a free woman, and uh, I suppose you'll go back to your own people. But why then, I asked you a certain question when you were on this spell one time. Ask me again, so she can see what I say. He asked her again, and she said she would. And as it was not a known at the time for people to be married in the house, and at night too, the curate married Dr. Mary. What began as a wake ended up as a wedding. There was gaiety where greeting was, music where mourning was, singing where cleaning was and the rafters run until the sun peaked in the window. And that's a true story.